there. Oh, we are live already. Okay. All right. Come, let me go and share my screen then. Okay, so now over here, this is just a bit about myself. So Liana, today, um, is this more of a workshop format or do you want to go and have a chat with me? It's up to you. Uh, it's uh, all to you. Okay, <laughs> all right. Let's do that then. Oh, I can see that Serena has entered the room. Let's wait for a few more minutes for all the participants to come. In the meantime, all right, does anyone have any questions? Go ahead and ask me or if you just want to sembang with me, want to go and ask my opinions on anything. If you have any pressing life issues, I can lend you a year or so. Mm. Yes, I'm, also, I'm also very passionate about talking about self-love and stress management. Mm. Hey, all right. Hi, sir. Hello. Hi, Serena. Thank you for tuning in. Hope that you're having a lovely day. Let me go and share with you guys. Yesterday I only slept for four hours only. Oh my goodness. Rushing a lot of proposals. Very, very good. Huh? <laughs> okay, let's take a look. What time is it? Ah, da puko sembilan. Okay, hello, hi, good morning, everyone. This is Teacher Kian, and I'm here with Excel Academy. And over here on the screen, you can just go and see a bit of my credentials. Now, all of this is not very important. Now, what I want to go and really go and tell you is, okay, now in my, I, I come from a diverse background, guys, okay? I come from a very diverse background. So actually, I am a barrister from the UK, from the UK Middle Temper, and as a barrister, I have been in the courtroom here. Yeah? And as an investment banker, I spent more than 10 years in finance and investment banking. I have been in many, many boardrooms, right? And I've done a lot, a lot of sales pitches to huge MNCs and GLCs. And after that, I went into education where I became a licensed headmaster. Until today, I'm still a licensed Guru Basa with the Ministry of Education in Malaysia. And because of that, I've been in many, many classrooms. But most importantly, what gives me the most confidence to come up here and go and speak to you guys about topics I'm so passionate about is that I'm a single dad. And as a single dad, I've been in the, yes, you guys got it, in the diaper room. So now over here on this lovely picture here, you can go and see my 10-year-old son, his name is Shinkai, and my six-year-old son, Sing Shen, right? So I take care of the both of them by myself. And of course, I get a lot of help from my parents. But essentially, what I'm trying to go and share with all of you today, why I'm so passionate and why I'm so hyper today is that I am an expert at establishing rapport. I am an expert at building connections with people. All right. I am also extensively trained during my barrister days at understanding human behavior. And I am also trained in the arts of persuasion and negotiation. Now, thank you very much, Amelina, for that very uh, for that very warm compliment in the chat. All right, so now to sum it all up, what am I an expert at teaching? Right, so now to sum it all up, I want to go and present to you something which I am a champion of, and this is not something a lot of trainers in Malaysia teach. This is something called the law of connection. We have all heard about the law of attraction. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about the law of connection, and this term was first phrased by John Maxwell. He, it is his number 10th law of leadership, yeah, the law of connection. Now, in the law of connection, there are a few aspects, but one thing which I really want all of you to go and take away today, ladies and gentlemen, all right, is that people don't care about the merits or the advantages of our product. They do not care at all. What do they care about? Our prospects and other people in our lives only care about if you can address their needs or their interests. So now the trick over here is to go and try to go and match the merits of our products or the advantages of our products to other people's needs. In other words, okay, if we are trying to go and build rapport with people, if we are trying to get them to like us, we always need to know where they are coming from. And in the education field, right, okay, we have this cardinal rule. It is called lifting from where we stand, okay, or whether where they stand, okay. We can only serve people if we understand what they need, okay? Now, 
I remember reading this really, really good marketing book. And it says that, you know, your own personal branding is not as important, okay? Because people don't really care about your personal branding. What they care about is how you can make them the hero. Okay, so now I would like everyone to go and take this away. Yeah? And if, every, uh, if everyone understands this, right, go ahead and go and type five in the chat so that I know that everyone is here and that we're all ready and in a receptive mood to get learning today. So go ahead and type five in the chat if you understand this principle. People don't care how great you are. People don't care about your branding. They only care if you can make them the hero, if you can solve their needs, if you can address their pain points, if you can go and give them value. All right, so now the easiest way to go and think about it is whether or not you can go and give them value. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for, for your warm response in the chat. Thank you very much. Okay, so now let's move on. Okay, let's take a look at how this law of connection can work in a typical sales process. Now, I have met many, 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 many salespeople. In fact, okay, I've met a very, very good friend who came to me a few days ago. And this really prompted me to go and include this slide in today's session, right? I'm supposed to go and talk to you guys about elevator pitches. But because of that interaction with my friend, all right, she is a trusted and very likable unit trust consultant. But because of that interaction with her, I felt that, oh, no, you know, I really can't. I really need to go and teach people this before we talk about the elevator pitch. Yeah? So now pay attention over here. Now, the best sales model I've ever encountered and which has worked for me all of these years through all of my pitches, through those large clients, turning sales teams around goes like this. Yeah, okay. First of all, we have to go and build rapport with our prospective customer. And secondly, okay, after you get your customer to open up to you, after you get them to love you, and after they feel comfortable with you, right, you start to go and ask them questions. Not just any questions, but questions to go and see what are their needs. Right? Next, you need to be very clever. Use all your previous experience to go and link your products and services to their needs. And finally, all right, uh, you need to know the skill or the art of dealing with objections, or as some people call it, closing. Now, obviously, I'm not going to teach all of this to you today because um, we are focusing on elevator pitches here. Yeah? So now, in the elevator pitch, in a very limited time frame, obviously, you cannot ask your prospects questions and you do not have the time to go and link your offering to their needs because you don't know their needs. So now, what am I going to teach you today? Today, I'm going to teach you how to go and make people love you very, very quickly. And then number two, how to go and deliver a 30-second elevator pitch which speaks directly to their pain points so that you can convert them in that 30-second time frame. Yeah? Okay, so now, maybe everyone wants to take a screenshot of this because this is very, very important. Try to go and use this in your sales pitches moving forward. Yeah? And thank you for joining us, Cynthia. Cynthia, quickly take a photo of this. This is going to be very useful for you. Now, the reason why I've decided to go and teach you how to go and build rapport today is because that friend of mine, I like her very, very much. She's a very sincere person, but she spoke to me for one hour talking about her product. And at, that one, at the end of that one hour, she hadn't asked me a single question. I was just interested in one aspect of her product. And I think if she took the time to understand my needs, she would have sold me the product really, really easily. But instead, she went on and on for one hour, singing the praises of her product, of her company, of herself, without really getting and showing a genuine interest in what I need. So it wasn't the best sales pitch. And you know, even until today, when I go to go and train certain companies, direct selling companies or MLM companies, I'm still quite surprised and disappointed to learn that many salespeople are still pushing the advantages of their product, the merits of their product very aggressively without caring about what the customer needs. And I think that this is really, really time for us to go and change that around. Yeah? Okay, so now take a screenshot of this. Let's move on. Okay, so now as a barrister, as a lawyer from the United Kingdom, they teach us three persuasion or three negotiation strategies. Yeah, okay. They teach us three of them. Now, the first one is what we call a competitive strategy. All right. The second one is what we call a cooperative strategy. 
Now, what's this competitive strategy and what this cooperative strategy? And you will notice that I've left out, I've purposely left out the third strategy. Uh. It's a spoiler, okay? I'll tell you guys later. Now, what's this competitive strategy? If you have met a salesperson or if you have met a person who is very merit-based, they just keep on talking to you about the merits of their product, the advantages of their product, right? Uh, these people tend to be very aggressive. These people tend to be very unyielding. They don't really care about what you think. They, they are just interested in pushing their agenda through. Right? So now, does this strategy work? Hmm, let's take a look here, yeah, okay? Now, there's another strategy, all right, which is employed by barristers, by lawyers, by frontliners, and by other salespeople called the cooperative strategy. So what's this cooperative strategy? <laughs> this one is the opposite of the competitive strategy. Over here, these people are just interested in building trust and relationship only. They don't really care about selling a product to you. They just want to go and maintain that relationship with you. So now, if any of you are familiar with DISC, I guess that you could go and say that these people over here, the competitive strategy people, are very D. They're very dominant, yeah? On the other hand, these cooperative strategy people, hello, hi, PB Clang. Uh, glad to have you with us this morning, all right? Now, over here, okay, people who employ the cooperative strategy, they tend to be the I and the S people, yeah, okay, they are very relationship based, but the problem is, okay, they don't actually get to sell anything. Oh, okay, right, so now, S barristers, we uh, PB. Yeah. All right, so now, PB Clang, I'm just going to mute you over here. If you have any question, you can go ahead and go and ask me, unmute yourself and ask me again. Or, you know, you can use the chat function, no problem. All right, now, coming back here, we believe in a third one called the collaborative strategy. Now, what is this collaborative strategy? Collaborative strategists like me, all right, we do not care about the merits of the product and the relationship is secondary. What I care about is whether or not you can win and whether or not I can win at the same time, all right? We are very problem, we are very problem solving approach and I only care whether you win and whether I win. It's not about the merits, it's not about the relationship, it is about believing that everyone can win at the same time. And over here, okay, ah, yes, we are very focused on the interests and the needs of both parties. And this ties in very nicely, right, to the law of connection. Remember, what's the law of connection, right? People don't care about the merits of a product. They only care if you can make them the hero. They only care if you can go and address their problems. They only care if, they, if you can go and solve one of their needs. All right, so now let's take a look at what we are going to learn today. Number one, building rapport. Number two, I'll teach you how to deliver a 30-second elevator pitch. Number three, dealing with objections. How are we going to use the strategies here? Now, let's be extremely clear, okay? In the building rapport stage, you do not want to be competitive. You do not want to be collaborative. You want to be cooperative. You want to let your charisma shine through. You want to go and let the other person like you because when people like you, they are in a receptive mode. Just like today, yeah, okay? I'm doing a lot of things to go and subconsciously help you like me. Why? Because when you like me as an instructor, it is much easier for you to go and accept all the things which I'm about to teach you. Now, when we reach the elevator pitch stage, okay, when we are delivering our, elev our elevator pitch, we need to shift into a collaborative strategy where we will try to go and solve problems and look for win-win situations. So remember, okay, when you're getting people to like you, people like you if you're straightforward, if you're trustworthy, if you, uh, if you are relationship building. But when it comes to selling your product, when it comes to going helping people solve their needs, we need to adopt a collaborative stance. Now, let's talk about building rapport. And I think that building rapport is really, really important because of the experience I shared with you. Yeah, One hour of listening to her talk, 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 talk. Okay, she didn't build any groundwork. She didn't build the relationship. She just went ahead and talked, 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 talked. I think that we can do better than that. All right, and today I'm going to teach you how to go and get people to like you very quickly. All right, I think that this is really important. We have to lay the groundwork here before I teach you about the 30 second elevator pitch. Okay, so now generally speaking during this stage, okay, we are making people like us. We are not talking about business. We are talking about small talk. And during this stage, it is important for us to freely give information to our prospect and to establish the trust. Over here, there are many, many, many aspects, but I want to go and talk about three of them today. Now, the first one is body language, ladies and gentlemen. And over here, we have our first activity. Now, I want everyone to contribute to this discussion. All right, I want everyone to go and take part in this discussion. Let's take a look at this gentleman over here. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, do you think that we can sell him anything or not? Type in the chat or unmute yourself and go and let me know. 
can we sell this guy anything or not? Is it easy to go and sell this guy anything? Yes. Hard. Hard, huh? yes. Cynthia, absolutely. Now, if anyone has any ideas, go ahead and type in the chat. Huh? Yes, Roger says hard. Cynthia says hard. Now, next question, okay, ladies and gentlemen. Why is it hard? What visual cues let you know that it is hard to go and sell something to this person? Go ahead, type it out. Or you can go and unmute yourself and talk. His, he has his hands folded and it looks thank like you. as if he's on the defensive mode. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So now let's type down some of the things Cynthia is contributing. Uh, and, and you know, she's very, very right. Okay. Her, his arms are folded. He seems defensive. Uh, okay. Seems to be on the defensive mode. And over here, Roger is also saying the same thing. Arms folded. And Adam is saying, okay, he looks stressed. Okay, any other things, any other visual cues which let us know that this guy is not really in a receptive mode? Anything else? All right, how about his eyes, guys? What, what about his eyes? What does his eyes tell, tell us? Um, he's thinking about something. Yeah, he's thinking about something. His mind is a thousand miles away, for example, okay? He's not giving us eye contact, right? Okay, maybe that means he's not very interested in what we have to say. All right, thank you, everyone. Okay, excellent. Uh, excellent interaction over here. Now, let's take a look at this second picture over here. Now, do you think that this girl is ready to go and buy what this guy is selling her? Now? Do you think that this girl is, is in a receptive mode? Yes or no? Yep. <laughs> yes. Okay, so Nazira says yes. In fact, okay, when I showed this picture to some participants, some people are very naughty. They say that she looks like she is in a selling mode. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, naughty, naughty, <laughs> um, naughty thoughts aside. Okay, now, I want everyone to go and have a serious thought about this, okay? What visual cues is she giving, which lets us know that she's ready to buy, that she's interested in the guy over here? What tells us that she is in a receptive mode? Come, everyone. Give me some ideas. Why do you say that she is receptive? She's already very attentive to him. He's looking at him already. Is yep. it? <laughs> well done, Cynthia. Okay, she's very attentive. It's close eye contact. Intense. In fact, I will use the word intense, isn't it? Intense eye contact. What else? Okay, come, everyone. Give me your ideas. Yes, thank you, Serena. Eye contact. What else? Hey, come on, you guys need to know this, okay? Oh, you are frontliners. You need to know this. Come on, come on, come on. Ah, what else? What else tells us that this person is in a receptive mode? Adam? Uh, at, um, beside him, show that uh, she already comfortable with him. Ah, okay. Sitting close to him, right? Yeah. Okay, good. That's one. All right, what else? Handsome, all oh, because, okay, all right, now, because the guy is handsome, okay? No, we are talking about the girl here. Let's focus on the girl here. Although, okay, Amalina, you are quite correct. The guy is also showing some positive body language. Huh? Look at his arms, okay? His fingers are folded. When people do a diamond pose like this, right, okay? It means that they are happy to share, all right? Now, when people go and show you their palms, it means that they're happy to share, all right? If people fold their palms, it means that they don't want, they're closed off, they're not receptive to you. Diamond is a very good sign if someone's talking to you. All right, now, anything else or not? To me, this girl is showing a lot of positive body language, a lot of receptive body language. Come, let me go and give you some hints, okay? What's she doing with her hair? She's playing with her hair. Now, if you are looking for a romantic relationship and the girl starts playing with her hair or starts playing with her ears, this is a telltale sign that she's into you. Playing with her hair is one of the best ways to know whether a girl is into you or not. Now, not only that, look at her body. Her body is angered towards the man, okay? Her body is angered towards the man. And look at this first picture over here. This first picture, this guy, his body is slightly angered away from us. Look at his legs and he's lopsided. This means that he doesn't really, he's not really engaging with us. He doesn't really want to be here. But if you look at this girl, they're sitting side by side, but she's angling her body towards the guy. All right, now what else? Okay, uh, one last one, which is perhaps a bit more subtle. She's crossing her legs. What does it mean that she's crossing her legs? When we cross our legs, okay, when, uh, in, uh, when we cross our legs, we are letting our spine relax. You know, the spine and the back, all right, the skeleton, we are letting our spine relax. This means that she's relaxed, she is receptive. All right, so now thank you everyone for contributing to this little discussion. So let me ask you guys, okay, and I want you all to go and write in the chat. 
is understanding other people's body language important or not? In sales or in pitching, is it important for us to understand other people's body language? Right in yes. the right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. What do you guys think? Is it important for us to understand other people's body language and to read other people's body language? Yes or no? What do you guys think? Come, let me know in the chat. Yes. Gayatri says yes. Very important. All right. Amalina says yes. What do you guys think? Maybe one or two more responses. Okay. So now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me tell you this, okay? It's not important. Why? Why? Okay. So what if you know that the guy is not receptive to you? So what if you know your prospect is receptive to you? Are you going to change your script? Are you, can you control how other people feel towards you? You see, the problem is this, ladies and gentlemen. We are so focused on analyzing other people's body language, we often neglect our own body language. Now, let's talk about control versus influence. Right, can we control other people or not? Can we control how they think? Can we control how they act? Can we control whether or not they're receptive to us? We can't. We can't. The truth is, okay, the only person we can control is ourselves. But we can influence them. And let me go and tell you guys, okay, what's the best definition of influence I have heard, right? The best definition of influence I have heard, all right? And I influence people on a daily basis. I'm a writer on LinkedIn, all right? Now, the best definition of influence I've heard is, okay, changing other people's or adjusting other people's behaviors by first, okay, changing our own attitudes and behaviors. So now, the only way to go and get people into a more receptive mode is by taking care of your own body language. Problem is, we think we're psychologists, we think we're mentalists, we go and watch mentalists on the TV one time, then we think we can go and affect other people. No, we can't change other people by reading their body language. We have to take care of our own. And over here, these are some of the four things which we really, really have to go and bring into every sales interaction. The most important over here is to smile. All right, if you go and show a sincere and genuine smile, if you are sincerely happy for this interaction with your prospect, right, that's the best body language you can go and show them. So please stop focusing on other people's body language. Take care of your own body language. It is far more important than knowing what the other person is feeling. Anyway, okay, as I mentioned already, we are, well, most of us are not psychologists. Most of us are not mentalists, all right? So don't guess. Just because the other person is showing you poor posture, just because the other person is showing you poor body language, don't guess. They might, they might be bothered about something else. It might not be with you. Like, for example, look at this gentleman over here. Yes, his mind is a thousand miles away. It might not have anything to do with you. It might not have anything to do with your product. So stop killing yourself. Stop sabotaging yourself in that sales pitch. Take care of your own body language. Keep your energy high. Right? Keep your confidence level high. Enjoy yourself. Be sincere, be genuine. Much more important than speculating about other people's body language. So before you start your 30 second pitch, all right, this is very important. Take care of your own body language. Yeah? All right, take a screenshot of this before we move on. All right, so now, if this was a longer webinar or if this was a longer workshop, then I will spend a lot of time here teaching you how to go and adjust the small, small mistakes we all make every day with regard to body language. Yeah? Okay, I'll make you a pro in making people love you very quickly. All right, now next. Okay, ah, here is a very important skill which I can't wait to go and share with you guys. All right, we all need to learn the skill of making the other person feel important. Over here, there are two aspects to it. Number one, okay, and this is something which I would hope that you guys take away from this. What is the sweetest sound in the world? What is the sweetest sound in the world to, to people? Okay, what, what are people's favorite sounds? What is the sound which everyone likes to hear? What do you guys think? You are beautiful, school. <laughs> Thank you, Anik, school. Yes, Roger, you are absolutely right. The sweetest sound to anyone in this world is their own name. So now, starting from today, if you are very serious about being a frontliner, if you are very serious about bringing value to people, if you're serious about being a trainer like I am, you need to start remembering names. 
and use it often in conversation. Now, now that we know what is the sweetest sound in the world, let's talk about what is everyone's favorite topic. What is everyone's favorite topic? All right, uh, related to their name, okay? Everyone loves to talk about themselves. Everyone loves to talk about themselves. When given a platform, people will continue talking about themselves over and over. And so over here, our skill, right, as frontliners, as salespeople, right, as influencers, is to get them to talk about themselves as much as possible. All right, now, the other thing is that we need to learn how to be active listeners. The problem is that we are always talking with ourselves when other people are talking. All right, but more on that later. Let's talk about names and asking the right questions. So now, the art of asking the right questions to lead people into talking more about themselves is a very, very, very lovely and fine art. If you ask questions which are risky, like this one over here I put on the screen, how is your work? Now, this is what I call a very risky question. Why? Because it might lead to a bad ending. It might lead to a sad ending because they might say, yes, okay, work was great. I'm very happy. I'm so satisfied with work. But more often than not, what will people go and say about work? They will go and say, oh my goodness, I had a horrible day. It was such a long day. I'm so busy. I'm so tired. Then the conversation ends there. So please don't go and ask them questions which are risky. Ask them questions which guarantee have happy ending one. Like for example, hey, you know, the MCO is lifting already. If you can go on a holiday, where will you go? Right, that one definitely happy ending. They'll start telling you about their, about their dream location. Then go ask them, hey, have you been there before? Then they'll start telling you about their childhood already. With, before you knowing it, they'll be talking about their childhood already. Or if people are upset, if your prospect is upset, not very happy, go and ask, hey, you know what happened to you? How did that make you feel? Give them a chance to go and air their grievances. Let them talk. And very, very soon, you'll be talking about their personal lives already. When you talk about their personal lives, then it's a great time for you to go and ask them questions about their needs. You see how this works? So now, one takeaway, okay? Get people to go and talk about themselves. Don't ask risky questions which have a chance of leading to a bad ending. Always talk about topics which guarantee a happy ending one. Okay, like, hey, you know, hey, do you watch Squid Game? All right, so now, if, you, if, if people say, yes, I did, then good, all right? You can go and talk about Squid Game. If heaven... Then you can go and say, hey, you know, do you like this type of movies? If you do, then you should definitely do. Uh, then you should definitely watch it. If you don't like Squid Game type of movies, what type of movies do you like? I can't wait to know. All right. So, all right. That's how you go and get people to talk about themselves. Now, over here, I want you guys to be genuinely interested when the other person is talking. All right. If the other person is talking, kill your internal dialogue. All right. Stop judging. All right. People judge us all the time already. You do not need to judge the other person now. You need to be genuinely interested so you get their buy-in so that you're going to put them into a receptive mode. If people are talking and you are having your own, hey, why this guy like this one? Ah? Okay, there we go. Then you're not listening to what they say. All right. So now this is the second aspect, making the other person feel important. Take a screenshot of this. This is very valuable. And okay, if I have the opportunity to come to your organization, all right, to go and give a longer training, I would love to go deep dive on all these topics because these are really, really, really interesting human behaviors. And everyone has their own experience. I can't wait to go and hear from you guys about it. Now, next. Okay, let's talk about appreciative language. All right. Now, here's the thing, okay? To be likable, there are a few secrets. One of the secrets is that no one likes a needy and insecure speaker. Now, all of us have been to webinars and online workshops, right? Okay, have you ever gone and met a trainer who keeps saying that, hey, why you guys don't turn on your camera one? Why you guys are so quiet? Give me some response, la, you know? I, I do not know whether or not I'm doing well. Uh. Hey, come on, okay? No one likes a needy and, inse and insecure speaker, all right? They are coming to go and train you and give you value, not to go and fill up their own ego, not to go and make themselves feel better, right? So no one likes a needy and insecure speaker. And this has a lot to do with how confident we are when we are, when we are approaching every interaction. How well can we embrace rejection? All right, so now over here, I'm going to give you a few tips about this. Number one, okay, and this is the best tip I can go and give you with regard to confidence and feeling good in every interaction, all right? Number one, you need to go into every interaction, every sales pitch, every sales prospect with an air of appreciation. If you trust your product, if you trust what you're selling, right? In your heart, you need to have this attitude. 
I am so grateful for the chance to expose this product to you. I love talking to you so much. Now, it is scientifically impossible for us to feel gratitude and nervousness at the same time. If, you, if your heart is full of appreciation, if your heart is full of gratefulness, gratitude, you cannot feel nervous at the same time because these are two opposite chemicals. One is serotonin, the other one is cortisol. All right, so cortisol will always lose to serotonin. Now, that's feeling confident, all right? Go into every interaction with an air of gratitude and appreciation. I have a great product. I'm so happy I have this chance to come and talk to you about it. Now, the flip side of the coin is embracing rejection. And over here, this is best told by way of a story. So now I'm going to tell you guys the good writer story, yeah, okay? Now, I am a writer on LinkedIn, and every day, Tens of thousands of people read my post, all right? I am a fairly good writer. I think I'm a fairly good writer. But guess what, okay? Out of all the thousands of people who do read my post, there will be millions and millions and millions more who will never read my post, okay? Why? Because they're just not interested in the topics I'm writing about. I write a lot about parenting. I write a lot about self-love. But there will be people who will not be interested in what I have to say. But ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you this question here, yeah? and I would like you guys to go and have a think about it and to answer me. All those vermilion million people who don't want to read my content, do they make me a bad writer or not? Do they take away my value as a writer? Right? They don't read my post. Does it suddenly mean that I don't know how to write already? Does it suddenly mean that I'm a bad writer? What do you guys think? Well, the answer is no. I am still a good writer. It's just that that happens not to be my target audience at this point of time. Please note uh, that I'm using these words, uh, not at this point of time. Why? I believe that if you keep the relationship open, if you keep an open attitude, if you do not hold grudges for people rejecting you, there will come a time when they need you and you want to go and keep those doors open. All right? So now treat rejection as, you know, they don't need this at this point of time. Improve wherever you can. I'm not saying that you're perfect. I'm not perfect also. I can always improve my sales pitch. Sure. I can always improve my writing. Sure. I can always improve my training. Of course. But, all right, always remember that it's more important to go and keep the relationship, feel good about it, so that when they do need you, you are their first part of call. Now, speech is also very important. Now, just now, I mentioned about the girl touching her hair, right? That is called, you know, uh, that is very indicative body language that she's into you. All right, so now over here, I want to teach you guys something called mirroring. This is called positive reinforcement. We get people excited about speaking to us by mirroring them. So if the girl is playing with her hair, you also play with your hair. If she is, if she is facing her body towards you, you also face your body towards her, yeah? And there are many, many NLP masters who go and teach this. I learned so much from them and I can't wait to go and share this with you as well. Yeah? Okay, now we need to go and stop using the word but, right? When we use the word but, our sales prospects will automatically assume that you are dismissing their concerns. A lot of the time, all right, sales prospect will go and voice some concerns. They go and say that, okay, I like your product. However, these are some of my concerns. If you go and say, yes, but blah, 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 uh, then they think that you are dismissing their concerns. No, start to go and use the word and instead. So, bagai contoh, okay? And to say, if they say, okay, wow, I really like this protein shake you are trying to go and sell to me, but it's very expensive. So, Right? Typically, what most people say is, yeah, it's a bit pricey, but you know, we use a lot of high-quality ingredients. Don't use but, use and. You can go and say, yes, it is a bit higher price than, other, than our competitors, and that is why, and that is why, okay? We put in a lot of quality products so that we make sure that you are getting value. You need to go and use our product less than our competitors, and you get better results. So ultimately, you save money. So use and, don't use but, okay? All right, and finally, uh, okay, just because people are quiet doesn't mean they don't like you. We need to learn to be comfortable with silence. A lot of times, okay, our prospect is thinking about what we are saying or they're taking time to digest. Don't rush to fill in the gaps in the silence. Just because people keep quiet doesn't mean that you have to go and rush in and say something silly. All right, so now, I hope that this is very, very useful to you, okay? All right, take a screenshot because, you know, this is worth a lot of money. I spent a long time to go and perfect making people like me, all right, getting them into a receptive mood. So take a screenshot of this and let's go into the meat of the discussion today, 
All right, elevator pitches, perfecting your elevator pitch. All right, now, so now over here, we are going to switch uh, from a cooperative strategy where previously we were very focused on relationship building, getting people to talk to themselves into a collaborative approach now, all right? That means now we are interested in our 30 second elevator pitch to go and tell people that I'm here to go and solve your problems. I'm not here to make friends with you. I'm not here to go and tell you about the merits of my product. I'm here to go and speak to your needs. I'm here to go and solve your problems. Now, if you guys understand, go and write a five in the chat, ah, to Liz Lima, write a five in the chat, okay? And then let's go straight into it. Let's talk about how do, can you craft a perfect elevator pitch. Huh? Okay, thank you very much, Amalina. All right, thank you, Cynthia. Now, if you guys are ready, all right, to go and learn how to go and craft a great elevator pitch, go ahead and type five. All right, thank you. All right, so now, great. Let's talk about elevator pitches. Now, to, in my mind, all right, I'm very clear that there are two types of elevator pitches. The first one is when you're talking to a receptive audience, all right? That means people come to the training or people come to hear your elevator pitch or people give you a platform to go and talk about your elevator pitch. All right. Or let's say you're pitching to investors to a like Shark Tank, all right, or the apprentice where they are here to listen to you. All right. So that is what we call a receptive audience. Now, the second type of elevator pitch is when you have 30 seconds to go and talk to an unreceptive audience. That means they didn't want you to go and talk to them. And this is like, for example, a cold call. Now, your elevator pitch will change according to what type of audience you are addressing. And today, I'm going to teach you guys how to talk to a receptive audience because the unreceptive audience is slightly more complicated. We cannot go and cover it in a one-hour session. All right, so now let's talk about receptive audiences. Huh? Now, let's talk about the anatomy, the structure of the best elevator pitches I have ever seen in my entire career as a lawyer, as an investment banker, as a private equity investor, as well as an educator, all right? And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen so many horrible and great elevator pitches during my private equity days, all right? When I, would, when, when I was investing people's money into new businesses. And the best elevator pitches all follow the same pattern. Number one, obviously, there's an introduction, okay? Number two, they always have a hook. And over here, people make a small mistake. All right, people will go and teach you that after your hook, you need to go and start with a problem statement. I do not agree with that. Instead, I think that we should establish value immediately. Immediately tell the prospect what you are doing for them. What you are doing for them. Okay, so don't go and start with a problem statement. Immediately start with a value statement. Okay, and the over, now, third step is that they always tease a solution. They tell you halfway how they're going to do it how they give value to you, but they don't give you the whole thing, right? And number four, they always show you some numbers, some proof that their claims are good, all right? And finally, the call to action, all right? What is a suitable call to action over here? All right, so now, what I want you guys to really pay attention to is over here, okay? Not putting out a problem statement, but instead immediately telling the guy, all right, your prospect, how I can help you, how I can solve your problem, how I can address your need. I understand your pain points. This is what I will do for you. All right. Okay. So now introduction, fairly straightforward. Okay. Hang on now. Uh, before we talk about introduction, let's talk about other things. Uh, okay. Now 75 words is the sweet spot. If you, if your script is around 75 words, you will notice that when you go and talk in a slow, purposeful and energetic voice like mine, all right, you will realize that it takes up exactly 30 seconds. So 75 words is the sweet spot. All right. Now, Okay, let's talk about the introduction. The easy one. Introduction is very easy. We're just gonna say, hi, I'm Ken from Excel Academy. All right, just gonna tell people your name, your company. Now, let's talk about the call to action. Why do I want to call, talk about the call to action first? It is because this is where most elevator pitches fail. Okay, this is where the whole pitch fails. If your call to action is too aggressive, people, don't really care about your value already, okay? In other words, okay, if I wanted to go and date Amalina, all right, let's say we are friends, and I go and say, Amalina, will you marry me? Or Cynthia, will you marry me on the first date? People are, not, people are going to be scared of you. People will think that this ask is too big, all right? So now you need to understand which stage of the sales funnel you are or which stage of the sales process you are then you can have a, an appropriate ask. 
do not ask for something which is too out of reach for the customer. All right, so now for an elevator pitch, normally what would be a suitable call to action? Giving them your number or giving them your email and inviting them to sit down with you for a further chat. This is not the correct time to go and close a sale unless if your product is so easily understandable that people straight away want to buy from you. All right, but most of the time, okay, it is not. Now, if you happen to be a property agent, then yes, your call to action can be asking them to go and buy from you. It can be, right? But if it is not very easily understood, then most of the time you want a softer call for action, maybe an invitation to sit down over coffee, a discovery call, for example. All right, okay, understand? Ah, so now introduction very easy, call to action, you have to go and put some thought into it. What do you want people to do after your elevator pitch? Okay, now sometimes, if you are with a very receptive audience, like for example, if you're pitching to investors, all right, I want 5 million and I'm telling you about my business idea in 30 seconds. Your call to action should be clear because your audience is very clear. Your audience is in the mood to buy already. So straight away, be very straightforward with them. Don't go and say, hey, you know what? If you're interested in my product, why don't you sit down for a coffee session with me? No need already, okay? In that situation, you go and say, I need 3 million and I'm giving you 30% of my equity, okay? All right, but that is for a very specific audience. Now, if you're talking to most people on the street, if you're, retail, if you're in the retail line or if you're a frontliner, then don't ask for too much. Don't ask for marriage on the first date. Okay, ask for a second date. All right, ask for a second date. Okay, don't ask to go and move in with her straight away on the first date, okay? All right, now ask for a second date. All right, or ask, you know, would you like to watch a movie the next time? All right, I'm like, no, you want to watch a movie with me or not? Okay, All right, something like that. All right, now next, okay? So over here, I've given you an example of what a typical good effective call to action would look like. Okay, over here, okay, this, let's break this down, okay? Over here, I have purposely used the words, I love working with trustworthy people like you. Okay, now why? Okay, first of all, okay, as I've mentioned, okay, you need to go and show people that you're sincere and genuine. Number two, this one is planting in their minds, okay, that you yourself, you are trustworthy as well, okay? Planting the idea in their minds that you, the speaker, is also trustworthy. Why? Okay, because you're saying, I love working with trustworthy people like you. It's an indication that I am also trustworthy and I like working with people who are like me. Okay, so now over here, you can go and take a screenshot of this and let's talk about the meat of the 30 second elevator pitch. Huh? Let's talk about two, three, four in the next slides. Okay, now guys, hey, have you taken a screenshot already or not? If you have taken a screenshot already, go and type seven in the chat so that I know that I can move on and go and give you some good stuff over here. Okay, all right. Now, come on, come on. I would like to go and see more sevens before I move on. I really want you guys to go and take away value from this. I want you guys to learn something good from this. All right, thank you, everyone. Okay, great, excellent. All right, now let's move on. Ah, okay, so now. Many years ago, okay, seriously, time flies. I think this was 13 years ago already when I recently rewatched the video. There was this author, his name is Simon Sinek. Many of you would have heard of him, especially if you're in the sales line, Simon Sinek. And he came up with this wonderful video on TED Talk, all right? And TED was very early in those stages. And this was called Starting With Why. His video is called Starting With Why. And starting with why is a really a guiding principle to how we should go and write our sales pitches and how we should write in general, how we should go and make content in general, okay? So now, essentially, Simon Sinek says that, you know, if you ever hear your sales prospect saying something like, hey, you know what, Amalina, I, yes, la, I understand that your product is very good. I know all the facts. I know that this product is good for me. I know that this protein shake is good for me. But, you know, I, I don't want to buy. La. I, I, it just doesn't feel right. Ah, okay, if you often hear your sales prospects say this, okay, I know all the facts, thank you for explaining it to me, but it's just not the right timing or it just doesn't feel right. Okay, why do they say that? It is because people make decisions based on their feelings. They make purchasing decisions based on their feelings. And after they have made a decision, then they only turn to the facts, figures, and information to solidify and to justify their decision. So I'm just going to repeat it again, okay? When people want to go and buy something, they 
rely on their feelings. Okay, if you're Cantonese, all right, then you understand where the cow feel get. All right, uh, we would like to go and say no feeling. All right, no feeling and no buying. No? Okay, so now we have to go and touch their feelings. Then we have to go and back it up with facts and figures to help them make an easier decision. The problem is, okay, most companies like this one over here, over here, we're talking about Dell, right? How does Dell do their advertising? Now, Dell sells a lot of products, right? They sell computers, they sell MP3 players, they sell, they sell uh, laptops, they sell phones as well, okay? But we are not ready to go and buy these products from Dell. Why? Because their messaging, they always tell you what they do. They tell you how they do it, but they don't tell you why they do it. All right, so now I'm going to write it up here, okay? People have a huge problem when it comes to communication, okay? They tell you what they do and how they do it, but they don't tell you why. Guess what? The why is the one which gets people to feel that they're on the same side as you. Right? So now, in addition to building rapport, when you finally talk, okay, you also need to go and help people understand why you're doing what you're doing, why you believe in what you're doing. So now let's take a look at how Dell typically sells their computers. Huh? They say, we make great computers. This is the what we do. Okay? We make great computers. And how they do it is okay, uh, by using the best technology. Now, do you feel like buying a computer after hearing this or not? No, you don't. Okay? Why? Because the way they go and tell you is presenting facts first. In reality, let's take a look at this company, which all of us know, and we are absolutely comfortable in buying things from them, even though they are so expensive. Apple makes computers, Apple makes MP3 players, Apple, uh, uh, Apple makes um, laptops, Apple makes, um, uh, what's it called, earpods, everything, okay? And we are comfortable in buying any of them. I'm not an Apple fan, by the way, but I'm still, I still respect their communication. Why? Because they always tell you why they do things first. And they always start with something like this. We believe that you deserve innovation. Then they go to the how. Therefore, we use the best technology. And by the way, you want to buy a computer or not? Oh, by this stage, we are so bought into their idea already that we will buy anything they sell us if you believe in their why. Okay, so now let's take a look at a very, very practical example over here, okay? And this is in relationships. I love using relationships as a metaphor to go in, in my training sessions because everyone understands relationships. Everyone understands relationships. Let's say I'm trying to go and call Amalina over here, okay? Let's say I, I, I want to go and propose to Amalina. Now, how do typical Chinese guys propose to their girlfriends, right? They'll say something like this, okay? Ah, Amalina, I will buy a house for you. Okay, Amalina, I'll buy a house for you. Now, Abdul Rashid, thank you for joining us. I'm going to mute you here. There's a bit of echo. All right, you can unmute yourself if you, if you want to ask me any questions. So now, Amalina, I will buy a house for you. All right, then the typical Chinese guy will go ahead and go and say that to do this, I will work very hard. Uh, so now, Amalina, is that compelling or not? Nice or not? Will you accept my proposal or not? I think that she's staying quiet. I think she's very shy already. Okay, <laughs> all right. So now, most people will not find this as a very, very compelling. <laughs> Amalina, are you here or not? Please don't be angry at me. Okay, now, all right. So now, most people will not think that this is a very compelling proposal. But what if we started with the why? All right, what if we started with the why? What if I said that, Amalina, I believe that you are a girl who deserves the best in life. Amalina, I believe that you're a girl who deserves the best in life. Because of this, I am going to work very hard so that I can buy a house for you. Now, suddenly, just by reversing the direction, just by telling you the why first, it sounds much more compelling already. But da, Amalina. Ah, that's why. Okay, so now we have to go and start our sales pitches by telling people why we are doing this, what personal experiences we have endured, what challenges we have overcome to make us this type of salesperson today. All right, what made me this type of trainer today? All right, we need to go and start with the why. And that's why very early in the start, I told you that I'm a single dad. I'm very passionate about helping people build relationships because I want to keep families together. All right, I want to go and keep families strong, for example. All right, okay, come now. That's the first part, all right? Starting with why, a bit of storytelling. But, okay, at the end of the day, we need to go and establish the needs of the client. And over here, okay, because we do not have the luxury of time, 
to go and ask the clients, the, for ask the clients so many questions during an elevator pitch, we need to go and do this ourselves. Number one, the first question you have to go and ask yourself, out of all your customers which you have served so far, all your successes, all of your success stories, what are the two things which are most important to your customers? And over here, okay, it might be money, they might want value, or might, they might want convenience, or they might want to go and take care of their families, or when buying your product, they, they really, really value peace of mind. Or maybe when buying your product, they want a one-stop solution. So think back to all of your previous successes, your successful sales pitches. What was important to your customers? What did they want? What was the underlying emotion they were looking for? People buy stuff for only one reason only, okay? It is because they believe that buying this thing from you will make them happier. But happier is a very broad term, all right? Let's drill down to more specific emotions. What emotions are they looking for? What is important to them? So now, let's talk about something which everyone easily understands, okay? Let's talk about, let's pretend we are a property agent. Let's pretend we are a property agent. So what is important to the people who entrust their properties to us? All right, let's say I, have, I know this rich client, and this rich client has a house, okay, which he wants to go and rent out to other people. And he wants to go and give it to teacher Kian, the property agent. So now, what is he looking for? He's probably looking for a high value, right? He wants me to go and rent it out at a high price. And number two, he wants peace of mind. He wants to go and pass it to teacher Kian, and then he doesn't want to think about it anymore. All right? So now, there are many, many values, not just these, oh, I wish I written down here. Different industries, people want different things. People want, maybe they want great customer service. Maybe they want you to be detail-oriented. Maybe they want precision in the product you're selling them. So different industry, different values they want. But over here, you need to be very clear what values are important to your customers. Now let's go along with the property agent scenario, okay? So let's assume that our client wants high value renters and they want peace of mind. They want convenience. They want to go and give the property to you, hand over the keys and don't ever need to think about it again until it's time to go and sign the tenancy agreement. All right, now the second question you have to ask yourself is, okay, why do they want convenience and why do they want money? Okay, so now what are they trying to avoid? So over here, we need to go and really think back to all our experience and to go and think of the worst nightmare scenario our tenants will have if they don't have us. If the tenant doesn't have us, what is the nightmare scenario they'll find themselves in? So typically, okay, uh, this would be using the property agent example. It will be tenants who never go and pay the rent for six months, all right? Tenants who run away, tenants who go and, who go and wreck your house, right? Or tenants who don't pay the electricity bill and run away. Ah, so these are some of the nightmare scenarios they will encounter, which they're trying to avoid by hiring you, all right? So now over here, what I'm trying to go and tell you is you need to know your client really, really well before you start your elevator pitch, all right? If you do not know your client very, very well, you need to know what the industry wants generally. Third question, okay, same as the second question, but what is the best case scenario they are hoping for, all right? So they want someone who can go and find the contractors to go and help them tidy up the house, to clean up the house, to make it presentable and to go and rent it out at a very high rate. Okay, so now, is everyone following? If all of you are following, go and take a screenshot of this. Let me know that you are done by typing eight in the chat. Okay, so now two things we learned just now, okay, when it comes to the hook and when it comes to go and establishing value, okay? Number one, okay, you need to start with why, all right? Always start your 30 seconds with your why. Why are you doing this? Why is it important? Why is it important to you, the listener? Number two, okay, you need to go and think back to all your previous successes and go and think properly. What are your customers looking for? What are your customers looking for? All right, what values they hold dear? What is the nightmare scenario they want to avoid? And what is the dream best case scenario they want, they hope to get by hiring you? If they don't hire you, what's the worst case nightmare scenario for them? All right, so now all of you are experts in your field. All of you have heard of all these nightmare scenarios from yourself, from your own experience, or from your colleagues. It's time to go and write some of them down. Now, in a full day workshop, this is the most important part. We will be spending a lot of time on this in a full day workshop. So now, if you are interested to go and bring me back to your, to your organization, to go and have a deep talk on this, please let Liana and Chick Amalina know, okay? So that I can go into your 
to your organization and start teaching all of you this very, very, very beautiful art of understanding your clients' needs so that you can talk directly to them. Yeah? Okay, good. Now, so now let's put it together. Part one, story. Part two, establishing value, all right? Or the hook and the value. So now let's start with the introduction we have already. So we will start with this. I am Ken from Excel Academy, and we're definitely going to end with this call to action already. I love working with trustworthy people like you. So let's chat at 012-7880-622. That's my phone number. All right, so now let's put in the hook and the establishing value into the middle over here. Now the hook, which I would suggest, let's say we are all property agents, will be something like this. When I was nine years old, I saw my dad get beaten up by his tenant who didn't pay rent for six months. Wow, it took memang nightmare scenario. That is like the worst case scenario already. So now you are telling people why you are property agent today, why you are holding these values dear. Okay, then you go on with the establishing value. So today, because of that story, which I encountered when I was nine years old, I help property owners like you to secure peace of mind. Ah, you're playing on the emotions, you're playing on the values here and high rental rates by matching you with quality tenants. All right, everyone understand or not? So this is half of your 30 seconds already. Okay, so now obviously this story over here is a bit exaggerating, but I, this is designed to help you understand why the story, why the hook is so important. So now in your profession career, okay, in your profession, you would have a lot of horror stories from tenants who didn't trust you at first, go and, uh, sorry, from landlords who didn't trust you at first and go and find your own tenant, then they have a bunch of horror stories and uh, this is the time for you to go and tell them, for you to go and put it into your 30 seconds. Take a screenshot of this, ladies and gentlemen, take a screenshot of this before we move on. Okay, all right. So tell them why you're doing this. What has shaped you to become the salesperson you are today? What has shaped your own values in delivering quality to your clients? Why are you like this? Why are you so good? All right, then number two, okay? Immediately help them see the value by linking your product to what they want, to what they need. All right, okay, awesome. So that's the why and the value. So now what's step three? Uh, now we need to go and tease a solution. We cannot give them the whole solution. We can't teach them 100% what we're doing. And we need to go and show them proof. Okay, so now over here, okay, how do we go and match you with quality tenants? How do I give you peace of mind? How do I give you high rental rates? Ah, so now, don't worry, as part of my service, I help beautify your property by managing all the contractors and cleaners so you don't have to worry about anything. So that's the teasing of the solution. Are you telling them where to find the contractors? No. Are you telling them where to go and find the cleaners? No, you're not. You're not giving them the full solution. You're just teasing the solution. Very importantly, and this is very crucial, especially if you're talking to people who are very experienced, you need the social proof. So next one, okay, just like how I rented out four properties for my clients in October above market rates. Okay, so now over here, we are showing numbers. Four in October above market rates. This is really painting the dream for them. You are, so now over here, okay, you are playing with their emotions. And now you're using numbers to help them rationalize their decision. Okay. All right. So now, obviously, over here, I've shortcutted a lot of things. I've given you the direct answer. But in a proper workshop, not all of us are from property agencies. Yeah, okay. Not all of us are from property agencies. So it depends on your industry. And I would love the opportunity to sit down with your organization to go and help you craft a great 30 second elevator pitch like this. All right, so now the gift for all of you today, please take a screenshot of this, all right? And you might want to go and start adjusting it for your own industry, for your own sales pitches, so that you can go and easily convert anyone within 30 seconds. And over here, okay, I've tested already. This really ends up to around 30 seconds. And I'm just gonna read it to you in a tone, which is very compelling. Huh? Okay, so it'll look like this. Make sure you go and get your energy high. Make sure that you are feeling gratitude for this opportunity to go and give to deliver your elevator pitch. And it will sound like this. Hey, I'm Kian from Excel Academy. Now, when I was nine years old, I saw my dad get beaten up by his tenant who didn't pay rent for six months. So now today, I help property owners like you secure peace of mind and high rental rates by matching you with 
quality tenants. I help beautify your property by managing all the contractors and cleaners so you do not have to worry about a single thing. Just like how I rented out four properties for my clients in October, above market rates. So now I love working with trustworthy people like you. So let's chat at 12 7880 All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of my little workshop. If you have found this useful, please write nine in the chat, all right? Take a screenshot of this when you are done. Type nine in the chat. Some bilan, okay? Go and type nine in the chat. If you have taken away something useful from this, this morning, take a screenshot. Please take this away, all right? Please tell your colleagues about it. Speak to speak to Excel Academy, Liana, all right? And I would love to come in for a course, all right? For a workshop, which is specifically designed to your industry, your company, the values of your company, the culture of your company as well. All right, so now, thank you very much. Here's some of the things which I train, okay? Because building rapport is so flexible, it leads to so many topics, all right? So I can teach sales and marketing, I teach leadership, communication, team building, family and parenting, self-love, happiness, and stress management, as well as interview skills for HR and employers, okay? If you realize that sometimes that you're hiring people which look great on CV, but are horrible in real life, uh, why? It is because the interview skills memang kurang sedikit. Okay, so now, if you ask me what I love teaching, what I'm super high whenever I'm teaching, that will be this tree, okay? All right, this tree. All right, so now here are some of my previous clients, which are really, really treasured clients. And over here, I'm just going to hand it back to Liana. All right, thank you, everyone. This has been a great workshop. I really appreciated the chance to go and share what I know with you. Back to you, Liana. All right, thank you so much, Teacher Ken, for the great session. Thank you, everyone who present here for your full participation. Uh, if you have any training needs in the future uh, for the related topic uh, that Teacher Ken can deliver, you can contact us at Excel Academy. You can also meet Teacher Ken in person since face-to-face -face training is allowed, but we must follow the SOP. So lastly, from my side, uh, I would like to uh, ask all of you here to scan this QR code and give review for us so that we can also improve our delivery in future. All right. I just give around one to two minutes for all of you here to scan this QR code. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone from Excel Academy. Thank you, Teacher Ken. All right. That's all from my side. Take care and stay safe. All right. Take care, everyone. Okay. Have a very, very good day. All right. Started out with something very valuable. I hope that you have a very productive day today. Uh. Go out and get those sales. Close those deals. Be safe and be healthy. Okay. Be happy also. All right, thanks guys. Thank you Gayatri for the kind words. All right, please remember, go and give me feedback. If you think that I'm of value, please bring me back to your company for a full day session, yeah? Or maybe a, even a two day session. You can go and combine other sales techniques as well. Or building rapport, making people like you. Yeah. If your company relies on making people like you, yes, then I'm the correct person. Okay, thank you Adam. Thank you Serena. Thank you Nordin. Thank you Gayatri. All right, I'll see you guys around.